Annie, the way I saw this interview panning out, and we, I wanted to, we wanted to discuss your book today, but I wanted to set it up because you have, you've been involved in notable cultural televised events, not just one, but several that having an understanding of that, I think will give every, will enlighten everyone to the way you think and why you've written this book. So, Obviously, when I first heard and AJ, that was when Texas Hold'em f first was getting on TV, and I and it wasn't too long in that where you had taken the prize, and that was number one cultural shift. That that was a very significant impact on culture and Texas. And I, I live in Vegas. I think about it all, all the time. And you're one of the notables, and then. The Apprentice and facing off with Joan Rivers, and you won that, by the way. But that was a that was one of the main that was one of the biggest seasons, if I'm not mistaken. It so was. It, I I feel a little bad because I was sort of on the season that revived the franchise. <laughs> we won't blame you. <laughs> well, with all of that, you know, and reading your book, I it's. I just couldn't help but thinking of the decision making and the way you have been able to see opportunities and and ride them out for the greater purpose of making the world a better place through your charities and all the work you've done. And not only that, and being a mob with with all of that. So, and now we you could set it up there because that that's just huge. So it's weird because like, obviously I've done all these different things. And so it looks a little bit like I've been all over the map, but um, there's actually this really common, there's a common thread that I love to pull. And then I'll find different ways that I can go deep on that thread. So when I was in graduate school, I was, I was, I was studying cognitive science, which is really um, how, how, you, it, you know, there's learning and decision making and how are you kind of building models of the world? And I think that one thing, you know, one thing, so the way, so when people ask me, what is cognitive science? The way that I try to get it across is, well, you know, um, there's no such thing as green in the world, the color green. So there are objects that have surfaces that light reflects off of and those wavelengths then uh, hit our eyes uh, that gets processed a certain way, and then our brains construct this idea of green that we then label with language, this this idea of green, right? So we have this concept of green. And the reason why you kind of know that is there are people who are colorblind. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and other animals don't see that color. So, um, but you can sort of take that concept of we're kind of interpreting the world in this particular way to anything. And what I was studying in graduate school specifically, while I did do a lot of um, psychophysiology and also decision making, so and behavioral science uh, and perception and all of that stuff. The thing that I was going deep on at the time was first language acquisition. So, okay, I know that's weird because I was like, wait, what are you talking about? Like, she was a, she was a poker player. Um, so, but if you think about it, it's like this really really cool problem, right? So, uh, how does the kid learn any words? Because the parent like points at stuff and says these unknown syllables like Dax, you know? And for us, if that, that syllable happens to be dog, it seems obvious that that means dog. But think about it from the kid's perspective, right? So let's say there happens to be a dog in the room. Um, is, the, is the parent talking about like the category dog or are they saying schnauzer? or mammal or animal or something. Um, they could be talking about like a feature of the dog, like furry or soft. They could talk about a part of the dog. Are they talking about paw? Because by the way, every time that you point to a dog, you're also pointing to a part of a dog. So right. anytime that you say dog, it's also, you could also be talking about the paw. Okay, so so you've got like that little problem. So hopefully that's helped if you point to a cat's paw or something like that, but I don't know. But then there's also, could it be an action? So maybe it means barking or breathing or panting or sitting or lying down or running. So it could be that. 
Or it could be like, think. That becomes really hard. Like, oh, look, I think that's a dog. Okay, so now it could be the word think. So that's really hard. And then sometimes you talk about dogs when there's no dogs around. Okay, wait, and then maybe it's a it's a picture of a dog in a book. So you're actually talking about picture. I don't know, like this, I mean, this, it becomes real, like, think about it. It's really yeah. hard. And here's the amazing thing. Every one and a half year old has it mastered. That's nuts. Incredible. Right? Like, have you tried to learn a language as an adult? Good luck. You'll exactly. see how hard that is. <laughs> so much more difficult right like some french person speaking really fast and there's all these sounds coming out of their mouth and you're trying to figure out what those words mean good luck right but kids do it really really well so so okay so what does that have to do with like everything else i did in my life well this is a really deep problem about how do you learn in uncertain systems there's there's no no there's no certain mapping to the sounds onto the words and so what i was looking at was it turns out that um language is kind in a particular way in which there's a really distinct structure to the language called the grammar. So just as an example, I say, if I say the Dax is walking, that eliminates all the verbs. It means that I must be referring to a na something that is an object, a person, place, or thing, right? And in particular, the places can't walk. So it has to be a thing or a, a, per a person. I mean, in this case, a dog would be like a person, right? But if I say the dog is Daxing, that's a whole different thing. So now you know it has to be right. some sort of action. And then I can take it even further, which is like, let's say that we figure out that it's an action, right? So I'd said the dog is daxing. Um, different things can be in different constructions. So um, let me explain what I mean by that. Um, so if I say the dog is daxing, but I could also say the dog is daxing into the room, that's really different than there are lots of things that couldn't do both of those things. They couldn't take a preposition or I could say I'm da I dax the dog. Right. So so let's take now we know it can't be look. Right. Right. Because you could the dog looks. That's OK. The dog is looking into the room. That's OK. But then I can't look the dog. So right. So now that 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 whole choice is gone because it doesn't fit into that construction. So it turns out that particularly with verbs, I could play a game where I can put it in enough context that you could actually get the exact verb. You, it, I could eliminate it down to one. Okay, so that's really weird and long, but what that means is that what I was realizing is that you need to constrain your choice set, right? That's what we we're talking about. It's like, how do you constrain your choice set? Because things are gonna go wrong in particular ways because there's a lot of uncertainty. And so if you're going to be an efficient learner, how do you actually constrain those choices that you can make so that you can learn really efficiently? So that's what I really cared about. Well, if you know something about poker, that should actually sound pretty similar to you, it turns out. Yeah. So and then now with my consulting and really talking in general about how are you creating efficient learning in uncertain systems? How do you actually figure out like what good choices are, what bad choices are? how you're supposed to figure out what the right answer is, all of those things. It's the same problem that I was thinking about a long time ago. It just keeps taking different forms. So it's always the same thread that I'm pulling on. I just sort of go and I sort of like, oh, that's kind of an interesting way to think about the problem. And then I feel like I got really lucky because once I started playing poker, at some point, actually a little bit through an accident because I got asked to give a talk, I realized about eight years into playing poker that um, – that there was this like super interesting conversation to have between like cognitive science and poker as like these ways to inform the exact same problem and that you could kind of really dig into the space between those two. And then that's been like, that's where I've lived since then is the space between the two things. That was long, but, and wonky, but I don't know, you can cut that out if you want. Well, I think, you know, one, obviously, decision making is going to be a big part of, of what we discussed. But I want to touch on two other soft skills that I believe go along with poker. And especially when it comes to developing out these these skills in ourselves to relate to people and to communicate effectively. And the first really for me is recognizing other people's tells and being able to read people and their reaction. And of course, at the professional level, we've seen on TV, people wear glasses and hats and all of these things to to remove any of those indicators. But it's such an important part of the game at a high level. How did you develop out that skill of reading other people in those tense situations? Oh, gosh, I might be a little bit heretical here. 
It's okay. The question that I have for you is how important specifically do you think physical tells are if people can be really successful playing poker online? Well, I don't know that they're necessarily important in the different types of poker being played, but more so in, you know, for our audience looking at how do we start to read people better? Because so many of us are focused on ourselves and, and how we're being judged. We're not paying attention to a lot of the message that's coming across from other people. Yeah. Okay. So I like that you put it that way. So, so let me, let me explain why I asked that question is that I think yeah. we think about the signals that people give us when we're thinking about poker in this very specific way that has to do with these physical tells. So I will tell you there is information in there. So essentially what you can think about is that um, people have physical, there are physical things that happen to people when they are uncomfortable. So that's what you're seeing as signs of discomfort. So barring someone being a psychopath, most people would be uncomfortable when they're bluffing because it's a little bit like lying. Right. This isn't gonna work if someone's a psychopath. I just wanna put that aside, but assuming <laughs> they're not a psychopath. So a lot of what you're seeing in the in the physical tells is going to be either kind of your autonomic nervous system showing signs of excitement or signs of discomfort. And the way that works in poker is that you can kind of map that onto signs that you really like your hand and that you're excited to be in the pot or signs that you don't. OK, so I just want to say it's not that that's not for nothing. Right. It's just that there are reasons that someone could be uncomfortable that don't have to do with them, li them lying, which is that they're being stared at or the stakes yeah. are really high or those kinds of things. So you have to kind of parse out a little bit. Is this really, does this really have to do with the hand they're holding or does it have to do with the fact that I'm staring this person down and nobody likes to be in that situation? But, um, so we can talk specifically about those things, but what I wanna talk about is a broader way of how do you actually read other people's signals and understand that there's all sorts of communication that's happening that isn't happening with words. Exactly. So what you wanna do is become a very good listener of of uh, what the story is that other people are telling you that don't have to do with the words that are coming out of their mouth. So I'll, I'll give you an example. So this is a pretty simple poker example. When people bet, they are telling you a story about their hand. And the way that you understand the story about their hand is that, well, if I've never met them before, I'm gonna take sort of what do most people do in this particular situation. So that's gonna be sort of what we call the prior that I come in with, my, my assumption that I come in with. But if I've played with you a lot, AJ, then I would know specific things about the way that you normally play, all right? So I have some idea of when AJ does certain things, this is, I've seen this in the past and this is generally what it means. So I would map those two things together and then if you did something that was surprising to me, I would pay particular attention to it. Um, and we need to be really good listeners of those kinds of signals because essentially what we want to do is people uh, people in general have patterns in terms of the way that they act. And then you can start to narrow that down in terms of the particulars of the person that you're dealing with and pay attention to what they're telling you. That's number one. And then number two is make sure that you are actually asking them good questions. That's number two, so that you can actually get some information out of them. So let me sort of separate those two things. So here's a really common way that people aren't good listeners. So uh, how much poker do you do you to know? A little, not not a crazy amount, but definitely played. Enough to throw down and lose. That's perfect, okay. So I'm gonna, Johnny, I'm gonna do this with you. Okay, so, so let's imagine that you, um, let's imagine that you raised before the flop and you had a hand like, uh, Let's say that you you had a hand like an ace 10, okay. ace 10, ace nine, something like that. And you raised before the flop and then the board hit and it was an ace, a nine and a three and they were all different suits. OK, so do you have that in your head now? So you have yes. you have you have ace 10. OK, yes. and the board is an ace, a nine and a three and they're all different suits. So you have a pair of aces. What about my suits? What about my suits? Doesn't matter. There, there's three. This will make you a better poker player. If there's three different suits on the board, don't worry about the suits of the card in your hand. <laughs> okay, so you don't care about that. But you have a pair of aces. So you raised before the flop. Somebody called in the blind, and now the board came an ace, an eight, and a three. Okay, so you've got like an okay hand, but not an amazing one. But it's pretty good. 
And now let's say that person makes a, a pretty substantial bet. They just, so it comes an ace at a nine and three. You're thinking, ooh, that's kind of good. I right. hit an ace. Um, but now they actually make a pretty big bet. So like what's going through your head in terms of what you think they might have? Um, uh, at least to match that with a, a pair, uh, at least, if not uh, a, the pair in their hand and, and one on the, on the deck, which gives them three of a kind. Yeah. Okay, great. So you think they have a pretty good hand? Yes. Perfect. So you and everybody else. Okay, so let's actually parse this apart. So this is, AJ, this is going to be get what you were talking about. Okay, so you've played enough poker, though. So let me ask you a question. Let's say that you, let's say that you were the other person. So let's say I raised you and you called me and you were trying to be tricky and you had two aces in your hand, but you didn't raise me back before the flop because you're a trickster. Okay, so I raised you and you have two aces and now the board comes an ace, a nine, and a three. You flop the very best hand you could have. Are you just making a big bet now? Well, no, I want to take your money. That's right. You want, you want to trick me, right? You're not just going to exactly. bet and try to scare me away. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, what if you had three nines? What if I raised before the flop and you had two nines? And now the board comes an ace, a nine, and a three. Are you just like betting out? No, I still want to keep you playing. No, you want to trick me. What if you had an ace and a nine and you flopped top two pair? Are you just betting into me? No. no. What if you had ace king? Are you just betting? No, because you have a really strong hand. So notice that your instinct there, what you think the story is that they told you, what your kind of automatic reaction is, oh, they must have a really good hand because they're betting. But if you're a good listener and you say, well, let me imagine, what if I were in their situation? Would I actually bet with a really good hand? The answer is not in a million years. So right. Why do you think you're any different than they are? Right. So, so there's a situation where now actually your first read this is where I talk about like reading people through patterns, through understanding what do human beings generally do? What are their tendencies? Their poker is a game of deception, right? Are they trying to deceive me or not, right? So that idea of, um, you know, they're just betting out with something where they have a really good hint makes no sense. The story doesn't make any sense. So now you know they have to be weak. So that tells you that your hand is probably pretty good here because uh, they must be bluffing or maybe they just have a nine, like one nine or something like that. And they're thinking, just like you did, if I bet, I'll look strong. Right. Right. Because if they were really had a strong hand, they'd be like, I'm just going to check and see what you <laughs> right. do. Right. So this is where we go wrong. Is that we're not we're not listening well. We're not saying, what are the things that they're doing? Let me not go with my first instinct. And let me actually put myself into their position and say, if I, what would it mean if I did that thing? And this is how we can start to construct really good models of our opponent. And this is much better information than whether they're blinking too fast. So I'm not particularly worried if someone happens to put sunglasses on, right? Because that is good. It, it's helpful information when I'm, when I need a little extra zhuzh. But the bulk <laughs> of it, the real work is this storytelling. Yeah. Now, is that a skill that you picked up before poker and you translated and that you were pretty adept at quieting your own story and your biases from the work you'd done previously to paint that story? Or is that a skill that developed through your poker career? Absolutely. And through think, my poker. I think the problem that many of us have is we get too tied to our own story and how we're presenting to the world. And we lose that ability to listen to what could someone else's story be? And in the poker, it's a great example because that story is far more important than your own. Well, that that's the thing, right? It's like, there's kind of two things. Like in poker, their story is going to be much more important than your own because your hand is only as good as it is relative to the other players. Uh, and that could be either you have a better hand than they do, or you recognize that their hand must be weak enough that you could make them go away. Because, right, we can take this to another level. If I, let's say I raised before the flop with a hand like um, a, a king and a jack, and the board came uh, an ace, a nine, and a three again, and the person bet into me, it should matter very little to me that I actually don't have a good hand here because I know they don't have a good hand. So this is exactly. a signal that I should be able to bluff them. 
you know, now how I execute that bluff is complicated and not for the show. But the point is that I know that that is what I should be planning to do because they've shown me a lot of weakness. So, but what people do is they'll just say, oh, I didn't make a good hand. And so I should just go away. But we need to understand like our stories, like the things, our position in life or in whatever is, is always going to be relative to the strength of the other person's position. This is certainly true in any negotiation, which is all that poker is. So um, so we always want to be taking that into account, which is why their story matters so much. But then here's the other reason why it matters is that once you start to really understand, if I were in their shoes, what would I think? Then that allows you to see yourself from their perspective also, which really matters because it matters what story you tell. So if I want to bluff, I have to tell a really good story about why my hand is strong. And I can't understand what a really good story about why my hand is strong um, is without actually imagining what it looks like to the person that I'm playing against. And I then I need to start getting specific because this a story of why my hand is strong would be different for someone who was new and an amateur. So for example, what we just discovered is I could just bet at you and you would think I was strong, but a pro is not gonna fall for that, right? So a pro is right. gonna know that's, mm, that's kind of a weird story. So now I could reverse that on the pro because I understand how they're gonna perceive me and I could execute a bluff in a different way against a pro, but maybe if I had three aces, I would just bet at the pro because they might then misread me as being weak. So now I can get like a lot of levels deep on that, but it all requires that I'm standing in their shoes. What would they do with different types of hands? What does this action mean for what they would have? Like if I had the, what would I do in those situations? That's gonna help me understand that. And then how are they perceiving me? What is, what is the way that they're gonna view my actions? And so it's all narrative based. And I think that people are surprised when they hear that about poker. They think that poker is like very math based and like people are running algorithms and trying to solve like these game theory optimal plays. And that is all true. Absolutely. But at its core, the way that you figure out what those unknown variables are which are two twofold. One is I can't see my opponent's cards. And the other is that I don't necessarily know what they're going to do with those cards. One person who has a pair might be very sticky and never go away because they think they have an amazing hand. And another person might be easy to push around, right? So I've got two unknown variables. What are their cards and what are they going to do with those cards? And the way that I'm deriving those unknown variables that would even allow me to get into a place where I could start to calculate out all the math and stuff, that's all narrative. It's a game of listening and storytelling. That's really what poker is. And obviously we don't have to get into the technical ways of how you bluff. And I'm sure there are a, a lot of complex uh, thoughts behind that. But just in general, many of us are in a situation uh, that's completely separate of poker where we know we need to be confident, but we're not feeling it inside. And for the amateur poker player, you could be staring down a, a crappy hand and knowing that, well, you have to confidently pretend that it's not a crappy hand. So how have you navigated that? And, and what are the lessons to becoming confident in those moments when you don't have it based on the hand? That's such a deep question. Like, I love that question so much. I like any question where I have to pause and like, you know, all right. So no one's asked me that before. So let me, let me think. I mean, or not that specific thing. So I, I think there's a lot of things that I do uh, and that I recommend that are around going, getting it to another level deep. And it has to do with that idea of like, everything is relative, right? So, so I'll give you sort of the overall example, right? I have, I know that I know very little about the game of poker in terms of what there is to be known about it. It's a really, really, really complex game. And I am just a mere human. And, you know, and so I know some things about the game, but in comparison to like what perfection would look like, I'm a disaster. So, so you might think, oh, okay, well then how could she ever be confident when she plays? I mean, I haven't, I haven't played since 2012. I would, I would, I don't think I could, would be particularly good today, but, um, but at the time when I actually was doing well, um, it's that I go a different level deep and I think about that, that, well, but how am I relative to other people who are also facing the same problem? And I think that that's where you can really find the confidence in hard things. Because if you can find ways, and, and hopefully my books help people do this, 
if you can find ways that you think that, yeah, it's true that if I were to measure myself against perfection, that I would be an absolute disaster. What really matters though, is how I am compared to other people who are in the same situation. So if you're facing a situation, like whether it's going into a negotiation or a business situation or a job interview or um, a sale or something like that, where you, where you feel like you're not, you're not really in a winning spot. But if you feel like you can handle that better than another person can, that's what really matters. Because all of us in our life, like, I mean, to use a poker analogy, we're going to have a random deal. We're going to have some good hands and we're going to have some bad hands. And we're going to have some mediocre right. hands. That's just true. What, what makes you win or lose is do you do better with those than other people? That doesn't mean you're never going to make a mistake. And it doesn't mean that sometimes you're going to have to play a bad hand. Of course, you're going to have to sometimes. You're going to get into bad spots. You're going to be dealt bad cards. But if you know, if you really believe that you have a good process that allows you to make better decisions than other people, then, then you can find confidence in that second order knowledge. And, and by that, what I mean is like sometimes you can be in a situation where um, it's a bad situation. So you're, you are going to lose to it. But if you lose less than other people do in that situation, oh, my mm -hmm. gosh, you, you're, you're going to win so much in life. Right. I mean, that that's the thing. It's like all about like, am I losing less than other people would in this situation? And if you really have confidence in that, you know, I think that's where you find the confidence. So I'm going to play this hand better than other people, even though it sucks. See, I love that because so many in our audience are perfectionists and they do want to compare themselves to the ideal. And even hearing you say, you know, I'm far from a perfect poker player. You know, many of us have this illusion of the people who are successful, that they have this just limitless confidence. They're not facing these calculations. They're not staring down these situations like us mere mortals. And therefore, I can't become them. But it's an important part of the journey that striving, not comparing yourself to perfection, but striving to comparing yourself to can I win a little bit more than others in this exact same position? is an excellent reframe when we're talking about confidence in any environment, not when you're just dealt two cards and you're staring across the room at someone else. Yeah, and I, I would add to that one other layer, which is sometimes that confidence comes from, am, am I handling this situ situation better than I would have in the past? So it's not just like comparing it to, comparing like how would other people handle this situation, but how would another person, meaning me, a past version of me, um, handle handle this exact same situation. And I think that that's actually really important because it gets you, you get your eye on the right prize, which is not perfection, but progress. You know, and, Absolutely. you know, there's that whole thing, which is like perfection is the enemy of the good. And this is one of the things that I, I say all the time is that we can really get hung up, particularly like in a lot of anxiety and analysis paralysis, if we have, if we have whatever perfect would be in mind, as opposed to um, look, I mean, uh, here, this is, this is something that I say, like in my, in my book, I say a lot of times when we know that we're kind of in a situation where, which could sort of be described as guessing, which by the way, is every situation you're in in poker, because you're, you're, you're doing some guessing about what the other player has. You're doing some guessing about what you think is going to be the highest value move in a particular case. It might be folding might be the highest value move, by the way, just cutting your losses or raising. And if I raise, how much should I raise? And, you know, these are all, these are all obviously guesses. So if you allow yourself into a situation where you say, well, I can't know what the right answer is, so therefore I can't do it because I'm too anxious, I'm too worried about being wrong, then you're not, you're gonna, you're not actually going to be able to make any progress. You're not going to be able to do anything because you're, you're going to be deciding too slow. You're, you're, the bar that you're setting is too high. You're not going to actually be able to act. And you're probably you're going to make worse decisions for it. So what I say is don't don't ever think about something as a guess. Think about it as an educated guess, because that's what all guesses are. There's nothing that you guess about that doesn't have some educated in it. And the question is, how much educated can you get in there? And if you can get a little bit more educated in there, if your guess can be a little better than the next person's or than your past guesses might have been, then you are going to do really, really well in life. So like one of the examples I try to give, like when we're, you know, particularly in this virtual environment where people can't see what my computer is sitting on. I say, okay, my computer's sitting on a desk. How much do you think the desk weighs? Give me the smallest amount you think it weighs and the, the biggest amount you think it weighs. So I'll just ask you to do that. So 50 on the low end and 
100 pounds on the high end. Okay. Why didn't you guess 10,000 pounds? That'd be a very heavy desk. That's right. Why didn't you why didn't you guess 5 pounds? It probably wouldn't be able to hold everything else that you need to, to keep on the desk. This is what I think the interesting situation is that and I think this is where people go wrong is that when I said to you how much does this desk weigh, a reasonable response from you would have been I don't know. I can't see it. Right. But I said to you, no, just give me like the lower bound and the upper bound. And you said 50 to 100 pounds. So it turns out, you know, a lot about desks. Because if it were a cow, you wouldn't have guessed 50 to 100 pounds. If it were a car, you wouldn't have guessed that. And if it were a feather, you wouldn't have guessed that. Because we know a lot about a lot of things that we don't give ourselves credit for. So that's number one is try to figure out what you know. But notice the other thing I did was I didn't make you get it perfect. I said, what's the lowest and what's the highest amount? So I was getting you into this Goldilocks zone of not just sort of abandoning and saying, well, I don't know, as if you knew nothing, but also not requiring that you get the exact number. Because it's rare that we could get the exact number because most of the things that we're doing in life actually are like guessing the weight of my desk. I can't see my opponent's cards. I don't know what they have. I can I can create a bound around it. I can, I, can, I can get a range there, just as you did with the range of the guests. And what's going to make me better than the next player is that my range is better. That's it. So, for, and you can think about that sort of, that's what expertise is, is putting in. So if I were looking at a cow and I was guessing what the lower bound and the upper bound is, my, that boundary would be much wider. I would have a much lower, lower bound and a much higher upper bound than a rancher would. Why? Because a rancher has more certainty about the weight of cows in general. So they just happen to know more. So their, their range would reflect that they have more certainty. And I think this is a much better way to think about this kind of stuff. Like, what do you know and what don't you know? And you can allow that to actually express your uncertainty. So it's the imperfection of the guess that becomes so informative. Right? What does it do? It allows you to say, this is how much certainty I have around it. Number one. Number two, it allows you to start really exploring what do I know, which actually gets you to a better state of perfection than you would have otherwise. And the last thing is that when I say to you, let's say you're a rancher. If I say, well, I think the cow is somewhere between 300 and 1500 pounds, and it's like a, a grown adult cow, inherent in there is a question of you to give me some help. And what's going to happen now? You're going to be like, well, Actually, I'm a rancher and I know that adult cows, 300 is way too low, right? So all of a sudden you can deliver some knowledge to me that helps me. And 1,500 pounds is way too high. We're not talking about, you know, a bison here. So, so you can actually now help to, to give me some knowledge that's going to help me to narrow it down because I didn't tell you I thought I knew in the first place. And it gets you like in that in-between place, which I really love. And certainly the process of, of dialing it in and gaining that expertise, it's a better lens to look at it, that we're, we're making educated guesses and the goal over time through education is to get that range to a place where it's more accurate. And so that you're, you're better in that state of uncertainty than other people would at handling the uncertainty and getting to somewhere closer because you're, you're not, you're doing two things. You're, you're, you're not demanding, you're not saying like, well, I don't know, so I can't guess. So that makes you better. And then you're also not saying, I do know that you're under the illusion that somehow you could know that my desk weighs, you know, not 93 and a half pounds. I actually don't know what it weighs, but you know, you're not pretending like you know the exact number either. What I really enjoyed about the book was that <clears throat> it, you lay out arguments for here's all the blind spots for our cognitive processes. Here's what you cannot do. And then um, processes of which you can compensate for that or what you can do to educate yourself for those guesses. And it starts out with the, f the first one being resulting and people measuring their performance on those results. And you mentioned about why this is misleading or how it can be misleading. Could you expand on that with us, please? Gosh, you know, basically here, here's the problem that we have as decision makers, right? It, like you can take the game of poker as an example, which is for someone to sort of look back on a hand that somebody played, it's very hard for someone to understand like whether the decision making was really good or not. It's complicated. 
because you know you, you don't really know what the cards are and um it's hard to work out that math like i could reconstruct the math for you but like i mean it, you know it's it's hard it takes a lot of work to actually reconstruct that math and and then you also have to explore what all the other alternatives were that you didn't take and compare those other alternatives to the one that you did take and you know i mean it's a big process so that's hard uh, and it's pretty opaque do you know what's not opaque and hard figuring out whether you won or lost <laughs> that's pretty easy so basically what we do when we're judging decision quality is we do this substitution which was uh we know that judging decision quality is really tough but judging the the quality of the outcome is actually quite easy uh, and this is actually uh Dan daniel kahneman talks about this um that this is what we do a lot in in subjective judgments is that we'll judge the we'll substitute the judgment of the easy thing for the hard thing so like a, an example from real life would be like um you're you're trying to hire uh um somebody into a job and they happen to be like really charismatic in the interview you'll substitute that in for the judgment of like the overall skill that you really care about for your job because that's like an easy and salient thing for you to look at like well they i really liked them right <laughs> like i got along with them well um and so then when someone asks you like do you think they're going to be a great hire you actually sort of judge how well you got along with them instead of the things that really matter for whether you'd want to hire that person this happens all the time but anyway one of the so this creates this resulting problem which is i won the hand i must have played it poorly I, well rather i lost the hand i must have played it poorly and we can see this happening all the time so i've talked about a variety of examples one of the most famous ones uh is the 2015 super bowl uh, if people remember this um so pete carroll is on uh, his the seahawks are on the one yard line of the patriots and um they're down by four so it's second down and they have 26 seconds left on the clock in the fourth quarter and they have one timeout so this is a tough spot, right? You have to score a touchdown. You obviously have three tries, second, third, and fourth down, but you only have 26 seconds left to get that done, um, which if you had three timeouts, wouldn't be so bad, but you only have one. So that just creates like this huge clock pressure. And also it's the Patriots. So um, anyway, so the, it's a very famous play because everybody was expecting him to hand the ball off to Marshawn Lynch, which he did not do. Of course. Um, and he actually passed the ball into the corner of the end zone uh, where Malcolm Butler uh, intercepted it. He had, he, he lost the game. Uh, and, um, everybody thinks that was the worst play in Super Bowl history. <laughs> so that we can, we know, here's how we can tell that this is a resulting problem. Um, so I want you to imagine, so by the way, the headlines were like so brutal. They were like, they, one headline actually called him an idiot. Um, <laughs> Oh, it was awful. <laughs> okay, so let's imagine this. Let's say that he uh, d he decides not to hand it off to Marshawn Lynch, and he calls a pass play, and Russell Wilson passes the ball, and it's caught for the game-winning touchdown. What are the headlines the next day? Genius. Genius, amazing, yeah. So that's how we know it's resulting, because we know very little about anything on one try. You know, it would be kind of like, you know, Johnny, if you, if you, if I was flipping a coin and you called heads and it landed heads and I said, he's a genius, <laughs> <laughs> right. you know, and it landed tails and it was like, you're yeah, what an idiot. But you know, by the way, but, but the funny thing is we do this all the time. So like, let's say that I offer you a really good bet on a coin flip. And I think that people can intuit this pretty well. So let's say that I say, if you call it right, I'm going to give you $2. And if you call it wrong, you have to give me a dollar. This is an amazing bet. You're making 50 yeah. cents on the dollar. It's incredible. You should totally take that bet. But everybody can feel this. So let's say you take that bet because it's a really good bet. And I flip the coin and you call tails and it lands heads. Don't you feel like you made a mistake? Sure. Idiot. <laughs> right. And I can also see looking at that and then remembering that and never taking that bet ever again in my in my life that's exactly right people think pete carroll made a terrible mistake that's going to stop people from doing that play which by the way was super brilliant right that's what i want to talk about is running with marshawn lynch was the most obvious play against a defensive mastermind who's going to scheme for the most obvious play even though he's an efficient short yardage back it was the most obvious and yet he gets slaughtered in the media after from that one result. But we do this to ourselves. All the time. 
So there are so many things that make that a great place. So that's one of them. Just like from a game theory thing, it's like, well, where do you think he's going to do it? And also, there's, by the way, there's like there's a whole pile of Patriots sitting right there. So just so you know, Marshawn Lynch is only going to score 20% of the time there. Okay. So then the question is, okay, but what happens if you pass, right? So uh, uh, touchdown, genius. Um, uh, incomplete pass. Nobody talks about it ever again. You know, and then obviously if it's uh, if it's intercepted, we know exactly what happens. But here's the really cool thing about this play. Remember, he only has 26 seconds and one timeout. So if he hands it off to Marshawn Lynch and Marshawn Lynch fails to score, which he'll do 80 percent of the time, the clock runs and he's got to call a timeout. So he burns his one timeout and then assume everybody wants him to hand it off to Marshawn Lynch again. That's his last play. So remember, he's got three downs. He he only gets to use two of them if he if he hands it off to Marshawn Lynch two times in a row to start. But if he passes the ball on on second or third down, on one of those first two plays, and it's incomplete, what happens to the clock? Stops. So he at least gets that third try. So he was maximizing the opportunity. That's right. So I am completely agnostic as to whether he should pass on the first or the second play. I just know he should pass on one of them. And what's the cost of that? The cost of that is the interception rate, which is only less than 2%. So yeah. this is the problem with resulting. Here was something that we saw that's only going to happen 2% of the time. And everybody's like, that was the worst play in the history of everything. <laughs> so, so we do this to ourselves all the time because what we lose sight of is that you could go through green lights and get in accidents and you can go through red lines, red, red lights and have nothing happen to you bad at all. And then we take really bad lessons. I mean, I not so much anymore because it's been educated well. But when I was growing up, I, people would say all the time, I drive better when I'm drunk. Oh, we, we, I, we heard that all the time. My parents used to say that. <laughs> right. And now also, I also think that, that this is happening with the pandemic as well. Someone pointed this out to me that there's lots of people who like, you know, ha went to a gathering of 10 people and they didn't get coronavirus. And now they're like, aha, that's a good decision. I should keep doing that. Or the ultimate resulting, the president surviving and then making rationalizations around other people being healthy, even though they caught it. So, so, but that's a really good example of resulting, right? You make a decision that carries a lot of risk with it, but a lot of risk does, isn't a guarantee. So, and we know that because like, for right, for example, in New York state right now, I think it's like, if you're in a group of 10 people, there's a, I think there's a 10% chance that someone has the virus. I think if you're in one of the Dakotas right now, it's something like 70 to 80%, but let's take the Dakotas. So you go to a group of 10 people, there's a 70 to 80% chance that someone has the virus. Guess what? 20% of the time, that means they're not. And so you're going to walk away from that and say, see, that was a totally fine decision. That was good on me. But you do that enough times and it's going to it's going to play out. That's why we don't think about the long run very well. We, we sort of get caught up in these short run, you know, loops about what what is how are we learning from the outcomes? And this goes back to that language acquisition problem that I got so wank wonky on. Right. Like, what does an outcome mean when it could have happened because it was a good decision or it could have happened because I got good luck? Or it could have happened because it was a bad decision or it could have happened because I got bad luck. Because all four of those things could be true. And trying to figure that out in retrospect is just like really hard. And our brain plays all sorts of tricks on us in that way that leads us to very bad conclusions and slows our learning down. That's right. I love the language aspect of the book, especially when it came to probability theory. And there was the long list. And you, the exercise is to write down what percentages you would think would go with each phrase or term and and aj and i play probability theory all the time we've been doing this company for 15 years and it's it's we'll make choices and i'm like what's the probability you think that would happen but i this was so great for me because to be able to see it in in verbiage and then the percentage after that with now the low and the high to go along with it i was like "Ooh, more tools for decision making how fun uh, I I love that. Could you expand on the the percentages and and the and the words and why that was so important? Yeah. So okay. So the first thing to realize is that in order to make a good decision, you have to be thinking about probabilities because 
any decision that you ever make is a prediction about the future, but it's not like the future is deterministic or something like there's only one way that something could turn out. It's anything that you do, there's a bunch of possibilities for how it could go. And there's some probability of each of those things happening. You could think about like a just simple decision. Uh, if I leave for work at a certain time of day, like I could get there on time, I could get there early, I could get there late. Um, there could be an accident and I could be like really late. Um, and each of those things is gonna have some probability of happening. And you know, there's a reason why you don't leave yourself an hour cushion to go to work, because that would be the way that you could guarantee that you get there on time-ish. I mean, assuming your car doesn't break down. Um, but we don't do that because it is probabilistic. We're trying to balance out what's the value of our time with how much of a probability do we need to get there. And you can tell that you're thinking that way, even if it's just implicit, because if you have a really important meeting in the morning that you cannot miss, you will actually leave earlier to increase the probability that you get there on time. So we are thinking that way. It's just we don't do it explicitly. And whenever there's something implicit in a decision that you're making, you're usually better off making it explicit. And so that's why we want to actually think about what are the possibilities and what are the chances that those occur. So the way that I start off is start thinking about that by using terms. Is it likely, highly likely, a real possibility, certain, so on and so forth. And so I give people, this is from Andrew and Michael Mobison, I give people a list of terms that would generally describe probability and I say start there. Just to get used to this idea of I want to think about how likely things are to occur. And I've got these terms that I can use that will help me do that. Maybe is one of them. I think it means about 50-50 for me. But then what I do is I take it further and I say, look, part of the problem that we have as decision makers is that often we think we mean the same thing as other people and we don't. This is generally true of like we 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 think too much that other people hold the same political views than we do, or we you know, if we like a certain type of music, we'll, we'll overestimate how, you know, that other people, how much other people like that music. And this is, if, if we think that mentor means a certain thing, then we'll overestimate that, we'll think that other people mean the same thing by mentor as we do. And I've seen that with coronavirus, like with the word like safe, you know, are you pretty safe about the virus? Are you careful? Um, and they'll answer yes. And you think you have some sort of agreement. Whereas, you know, when they say, yeah, I totally, I wear my mask whenever I go into a bar. And you're like, whoa, wait, that's a totally different careful than I think. But you, because you're not actually defining the terms. <laughs> right. So, so this is a problem that we have that we don't actually dig down and get some definition around these terms. And this is particularly true when we're using terms like re real possibility. So what I ask people to do is actually take this list that I provided them after I've sort of gotten them used to like thinking this way and write down if you were to use the term like real possibility, like there's a real possibility it's going to rain tomorrow. How many days out of 100 are you saying it will rain, right? And that gives you a probability. So if you think it's like 30 times out of 100, if I use that term, then, then it would be 30%. So I get them to write this down. But then I say, now I want you to go ask three friends. Don't tell them what your answers were. And just get their answers also. And then it turns out nobody agrees with anybody on this stuff. <laughs> so real possibility, the lower the the smallest number that I've ever seen someone answer real possibility means is 16% and the highest is 81. So imagine if I say there's a real possibility of rain tomorrow, I could mean don't really buy, don't bring an umbrella because there's only a 16% chance and you could be totally like geared up or wanting to cancel because you think I told you there was an 81% chance. And by the way, just so you know how big this problem is, people don't agree on what always and never mean. No. Never means somewhere between uh, zero and 10% of the time and always is in, in the similar range, right? So for me, always means always. It means 100%. Never means never, which is zero. But then when you, when you actually quiz people on it, they mean, oh, well, no, I don't really mean never. Well, that's an interesting point. As in, Even in our classrooms, when it comes to, to language, we've always talked about people, unless you're absolutely certain, certain, remove absolutes because you're not doing yourself any favors. Not at all. So now what I do is I say, so so now I say, okay, so now you really shouldn't be using these terms like real possibility when you're trying to figure out like, what are the chances I get to work on time if I leave at this hour? Don't say, well, there's a real possibility I'll get to work on time. Actually put a number to it. And now that shouldn't be so scary because you just created a list. So you can carry that list around with you. And okay. when the term real possibility comes into your head, then just look at your list and say, well, what I mean by that is 62%. So that's what I'll say. 
And it kind of, and and notice now people know what you mean. And then if they say, well, I think there's a real possibility back to you, say, well, what does that mean? Like, what could you express that as a percentage, please? Or if they say, uh, I'm being very careful about coronavirus, make sure you define what careful means. And, and one of the ways that I do that with coronavirus is I say, imagine that you have coronavirus, like you got a positive test today. Tell me how you got it. Boy, you learn a lot about people that way because I make you define what careful means when I ask you the question that way. And we need to define terms better. When someone says, I think this job candidate is gonna be a great mentor, say, well, what does mentorship mean to you? Like, what do you mean by mentor? And make people define it so that you can at least be having the same conversation that you think you're having in your head. That seems to be a large problem in, in today's culture, especially with tech. Everyone's living in these sub-genres and some cultures of, of gamer world and musician world and this world and that world. And everyone has different terms. And I've learned just for my own sanity to ask people to define what they mean because of of just how wildly different everyone is involved in living and 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 those were the, that language is in their culture is that's exactly right well we love asking all of our guests what their x factor is and what is a skill set or a mindset that unlocks success in their life and makes them unique what do you think your x factor is annie I'll tell you what I think it is. I think that uh, I am pretty good at mental time travel. I do it a lot. So uh, the example of that would be I try to get myself far, far into the future to think about what the impact of any kind of decision I might make right now is. And this is actually a place where decision making can get really bad. Um, it's sort of the problem of I want to eat healthy, but there's cake right in front of me. So I'm pretty good at saying, yeah, but in a, in a week, am I going to be happy that I ate that cake? Um, and I use that skill a lot, not just in executing on my goals, like what's actually going to allow me to execute on my goals, but also in the moment, like it stops me from getting like sort of uh, making emotional decisions. So, you know, like when you're on with a customer service agent and you're really pissed off and you just want to yell at them and tell them they're an idiot. I, I'm pretty good in that moment of saying, is that actually going to help me achieve my goal? Am I going to regret having gotten pissed off at this person? Is this going to do what I want? So I think I'm pretty good at like interrupting those sort of in the moment processes and getting pretty far in the future and thinking about, well, how is this going to play out in the future? Am I going to regret this in the future? Is Does this seem good in terms of my ability to achieve my goals? Now, I will say that that has a dark side, which is it means like I'm always thinking about death and getting old. <laughs> no, really. <laughs> Really, like, t I feel like time feels a little bit faster to me because I am thinking like, you know, I'll be like 10 years in the future sometimes and I'll be like, oh my God, like I'm going to, you know, so I, I think about mortality a lot more than most people do, I think, but it has a good side too, which is that I think I'm less impulsive than most people are. I would Definitely. say that's my X factor is I can sort of get myself out, but you know, that's the, kind of the same thing as I can get myself out of my own head into somebody else's head. That was really important in poker. I didn't go on tilt in poker because I would think about what my long-term goals were, you know, that kind of stuff. And I think that sort of comes across a lot of the stuff that I do. But then also I'm sad because I'm going to die. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing. And it's such a great way to look at things for those in our audience who are trying to become better decision makers. And we thoroughly enjoyed the book and can't wait to see what's next for you. Any parting words of where our audience can find you or what they can look out for? Yeah, sure. So um, you can find me at AnnieDuke.com, my website, and there's lots of video of me and you can link to my articles and podcasts that I do there. You can find my books there. Um, you can find my newsletter there. There's a contact form and I do actually try to respond to everybody who writes me. I'm probably 80% or 90% on that, but it's not because I didn't want to respond to you. It's because it got buried in my email and my <laughs> life, but I am attempting. I am attempting. Um, so I love when people write to me, actually, that actually tends to spur a lot of the thinking that I do is, is hearing from other people and kind of what's on their mind. And then you can also find me on Twitter at Annie Duke. I'm pretty active over there. Um, it, it's a better place to reach me than like LinkedIn or Instagram or right. whatever, like just go over to Twitter, you can have a conversation with me over there. Um, yeah, so that's kind of where you can, that's where you can find me. And then, you know, you can find my books. <laughs> how to decide and thinking in bets and then the next book i'm writing someday will appear on there so awesome well thank you so much good luck on your live great thank you oh thank you so much that was perfect timing Be free.